Wow. It's kind of hot in there. <laughs> Can I sit on a horse? It might work better. Wow. I thought there'd be about five people sitting out there. Are you satisfied? Amazing. Thank you very much for, for showing up. Hey, Michael. Yep. Did you hear them laugh when they, when they announced Free Willy? I was laughing too. <laughs> Why is that? Well, because it's kind of like the last picture that I ever expected anybody would ask me to be involved in. I remember when I was reading the script, I, um, I thought maybe there was a page I missed or something. You know, I, how come I'm not doing anything bad? <laughs> But I realized it was my shot to uh, just play a father, somebody nice, and uh, you know, I did the second one too. I skipped out on Willie three. <laughs> yeah, it was over by then. It was, uh, so you were nice twice. Yeah, twice nice. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think I'd like to put you to work immediately. Oh no, God no! Yeah. Did yeah, you bring your glasses? Work. I did. Yeah. As a matter of fact, they're, just I to think see, they're broken. you know, to get an idea of, of how you see yourself. Side of it was broken. I'd like you to read a poem here. It's from American Badass, and uh, it's called A Man Without a Country. Man Without a Country. Mm. All right. I definitely got to put these on. Hold on. They're broken. All right. Man Without a Country. A lot of noise out there, brother. Yeah. You have to shout. Someone asked me if I wanted to stay and watch the village blow up. And I said, well, I've lot of, seen a lot of things blow apart, even in my own life. So maybe I'll just go back to the hotel. Walking back to the trailer, I saw a little Thai boy with a bow and arrow, and an even younger one sucking his mama's tit. A big pig with baby pigs, and the sun was setting and an old woman with rotten teeth was laughing at something. And I realized that after 51 years, I finally figured out who I was. I'm a man without a country. I'm a man with a shattered heart. And I'm a man who will never understand the goings on in this universe. But early in the morning when the birds are singing their birdie songs, I know somehow I'm going to be all right. It's the first time I felt that way in a very long time. Thank you. You're welcome. That is um, from American Badass. Is that you, the American Badass? Um, you know, I was trying to think of a good title for a book, and um, I didn't want it to be um, pretentious, you know, or hokey or something, and I, it just It came into my head somewhere, and I I, uh, I mentioned it to the publisher, and they said, "Yeah, that's a good idea." So, so well, um, who is it? You are you a badass? I guess so. I, I, it's not for me to say. It's the title of a book. <laughs> it's about me, <laughs> but I think I'm a lot of things, just like you are, and just like everyone else. Nobody's got one thing that's going on. Everybody has multiple personalities. Okay, but it, it doesn't say American nice guy. Well. You see, the thing is, is the title is that, but inside is something else. So, what is inside? Then? That's a little message for you. What, tell me, what is inside? <laughs> well, I'm not Rufus Wainwright, if that's what you want to know. <laughs> that's what you're getting at. Uh, I just think there's a lot of different colors to a lot of different people, and um, people in life tend to get categorized into stereotypical ideas and people are a lot more complex than that. Yeah, I'm not really satisfied with this answer. I, I think there's many sides to everybody. That's true. And um, I've been backed into a corner uh, playing a villain. And um, I may understand the villain mind, or the villain heart, but... Uh, I'd like to think that there's more to me than that. 
And so now I got invited to this thing, which is kind of a vindication in a weird way. And so I'm going to try to enjoy it, but if I over-explain it, then no one's going to give a shit anymore. All right. So I thought I could divide you into three personas, the poet, the actor, and the family man. Since you are known as a, an actor, I would like to start with that one. You, you just said that uh, this, this, this villain part is sort of, you know, it's not your choice. It sounds like as if not, it's not your choice. Well, I don't think that T.S. Eliot um, or William Shakespeare was, I don't think he decided on his own that he was going to do anything either. I don't think that uh, Hunter Thompson decided on his own to blow his head off. I mean, listen, I'll ask you this. If you force sex on a prostitute, is it rape or shoplifting? <laughs> That's a good answer for you, pal. <laughs> <laughs> Somehow I got this idea that you thought about this before. <laughs> It just came into my head just right, now. Yeah. <laughs> well, then you're brilliant. Yeah. I hear St. Louis back there laughing. I think that's so Louis must laughing. Have, yeah. Must have worked well, yeah. He'll come and join us in a minute. Oh, do, you, God, do, you remember, do you remember when you wanted to be an actor? Did you, were you born an actor or did you decide to come, become one? Um, I think it... Um, I think it happened through a series of uh, a series of misunderstandings. I um, I worked a lot of different jobs. I was an auto mechanic, and uh, I worked as a pipe fitter, and um, I drove a lot of tow trucks, and I worked as an apprentice to a plumber. I cut pipe, and I had a landscaping business, and I even worked as an orderly in a hospital. You know, my father wanted me to be a policeman, and uh, the chances of that happening were not very good. So I did a lot of things for a long time, and I couldn't really figure out where to go, and I kept getting in trouble. Um, I was very mischievous, and uh, but I always liked watching movies, and I I always had an admiration for people like Humphrey Bogart and. Bobby Mitchum and um, Kirk Douglas and Burt Lancaster and Lee Marvin. A lot of guys that I watched growing up, and I knew that they had their trouble and I knew that they were whatever they were, but I also knew that they were portraying themselves more than they were trying to play, uh, you know, Macbeth or something. Hmm. And I kind of figured that it was a way out for me, it was an escape for me. Something that if I tried it and if it didn't work, well, then so be it. You know, I'd put a bullet in my head or go back to jail. And I um, I was lucky enough and fortunate enough to meet a few people that uh, were able to help me into a film career. And um, I didn't really know what I was doing in the beginning, to be honest with you. And, uh, Well, one thing worked out after another, and it, uh, I'm very happy that I found a spot for myself. It's a, you know, it, a movie acting thing is really kind of, it's um, it's a double-edged sword, you know. It's really good for you in the good times, and in the bad times, it it'll tear you apart. It's a, it's a very troubling thing to do. It's a very neurotic thing to do for a living. It's um, when when does it tear you apart then? Well, when you spend a 14, 15 hour day, six, seven days a week, and you're playing another person, and you become that other person, sooner or later, you know, all the fireworks go out, and it's time to go home. And uh, to your own self. You find home life to be uh, a bit sedated. Mm. And then you have a lot of responsibilities that you have to deal with. And, you know, it's... Uh, It's precarious. But would you say that acting is escaping life then? No, I think it's it's a part of life. It's a part of my life. It's uh, escapism for people who watch these kinds of things, just as it was for me as a kid when I watched movies. Yeah. I, I read somewhere that you, you thought that acting wasn't really a very masculine thing to do. 
It was more something for sissies and faggots. <laughs> well, that's your words. I, well, I, I, just I never to... said either one of those two words, so you keep those to yourself, okay? All right, I will. Don't put words in my mouth. But you, you know what I mean? I said I... it wasn't masculine. I didn't say the other thing. All right. That came from you. All right. Go on. Um, I think that, uh, I, 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 you know what, I admired Robert Mitchum for many years, for all my life, and I even met him one time. And at the very end, when he was an old man, I, I read this interview that he wrote, and he said, acting is a very humiliating and embarrassing profession. They pay you to do nothing, and in the end, it all means nothing. <laughs> it's just, you know... <laughs> and that, you thought that's my job. All the wonderful films that he made, and all of the wonderful memories that he gave to so many people, you know, and that's how he felt inside himself. I, it was hard to deal with that. It was very strange to me. It was, uh, sometimes it can be very unmasculine. Yeah, that's true. But what, what is unmasculine about it? Being repetitive about a moment, you know. I pick this fucking thing up, and I, ah, okay. But then if you try doing that 15 times, yeah, the same way, you know, it's, it's not what you think. You got to find different ways to do it, you know. Yeah. There's many different ways to pick it up, you know. Or you could not pick it up at all. But wouldn't you think you would be happier as a lumberjack or a lion tamer or something masculine? You know, I, I was doing this movie one time, and um, I was in Toronto. And I was playing an ex-major uh, league baseball player. And it's 20 years after he won the MVP, and he's retired, and he's all fat, and he has a big beard, and he has a 15-foot tapeworm in his stomach. And um, this guy was in the movie who was a rabbi, and they got a real rabbi to play the rabbi. And he was he was watching me change my clothes because I I didn't feel like going out to my trailer and so I was changing clothes in the in the dining room. And he says, uh, "What are you doing over there?" And I said, I, "I'm changing my clothes, man." And he goes, "Are you in the movie?" And I said, uh, "Yeah." And he goes, "Are you an actor?" And I said, uh, "No, <laughs> no, I'm not." And he goes, ah, me neither. And I said, okay, I know you're, you're a fucking rabbi. So <laughs> I, I, I get it. I said, it's perfect casting. <laughs> he says, so what do you do? What do you normally do when you're not trying to be an actor? And I said, ah, I was thinking about being a lumberjack. And he goes, ah, lumberjack, I bet you know an awful lot about wood. <laughs> <laughs> I said, yeah, yeah, I'm an expert on wood, yeah. He goes, so we're in a log cabin, right? And he's like, what kind of wood is that over there? And I said, oh, God. Well, that's, uh, that's cherry wood. And he goes, oh, I didn't know that. I said, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know you didn't know that, so I tricked you. And he says, well, what kind, of, what kind of wood is that over there? And I said, oh, that's, uh, I don't know, that's mahogany. And he goes, oh, my goodness, you do know a lot about wood. I said, yeah. So we go outside and we shoot this whole thing where he's going to do like a wedding ceremony and he did the whole thing for real, and even though it was MOS and everybody told him that, but he just kept going on. <laughs> and at the very end, when he was done for the day, he stood up in front of everybody and he said, uh, I had a really wonderful time today. I had a great, wonderful time with all you people. I wanted to thank everybody, especially the lumberjack. <laughs> that kind of sums it up. Yeah, it does. Uh, you think you're getting better? Getting better? Yeah. Um, I think I'm getting smarter. I think I'm a little smarter. I think I'm a little bit more, um, I don't know, you know, there's a big price to pay for intelligence. A lot of people make it through being dumb. <laughs> and I, I wonder sometimes if I'd be better off stupid, but, you know. At least you can claim irresponsibility for things if you're dumb. If you're smart enough to know what you're doing, it's, uh, you know, 
you have to take responsibility for what you do. But I mean, uh, can you can you see that, uh, for instance, do you watch your own movies or don't you? Don't you? Um, you know, there are some things I like to look at that because it has a bigger meaning than than what was intended by the filmmaker. Maybe I kind of lost the uh, um, fascination of watching myself a long time ago. And it's more of a, um, I want to know that the whole thing works together as a story. I become a storyteller instead of a, a, a puppet. And I, there are some things I like to look at, and sometimes I see something I did a few years ago, yeah. and I appreciate it a lot more than I did at the time. There's only maybe a handful of pictures that I've done that I really feel are any good. And, uh, you know, a lot of the rest of them I can care less about maybe it's a good moment to let you read something more uh, a poem called movies that's a long one no that's a good one yeah no what's, thank what's you for good everyone. what's good about it um well what it is is that i was once upon a time when i was writing a lot I tried to figure out what was all the best moments that i remembered from pictures that i saw that kind of convinced me or tricked me into believing that I could be a motion picture actor and so I, I wrote them down one by one and I, I it's, it's almost like a <laughs> it's like a shopping list look at him with that Stetson where'd you get that hat man? oh right it's <laughs> <laughs> yeah you know when I did Kill Bill I had a hat just like that is that why you have that thing on That's a good answer, because that's what I told Quentin, and he didn't want me to wear that fucking hat. <laughs> and that's why he wrote that scene where I have to take it off. <laughs> that's pretty funny. You're not, you're not, you're not going to wear that hat. You're not going to wear that hat in the movie. And I said, uh, yes, I am. And so then he wrote a scene where I have to take it off. Clever boy. <laughs> <laughs> I'll start reading? Give me that thing. All right, hold on. <coughs> If I'm here long enough, my glaucoma will probably go away. <laughs> Remember when all the men on the ship said goodnight to Mr. Roberts? Or when Shane rode off over the mountain? Kirk Douglas trying for the note on the trumpet and Jimmy Cagney screaming on top of the tower. Bob Mitchum going after those kids and Humphrey Bogart pulling leeches off his body. Marlon Brando finding the dead pigeons on his roof. Gloria Swanson walking down those fucking stairs and Betty Davis testing the weight of a rifle. Chuck Heston finding his mother and sister and Charles Bronson getting shot in the Magnificent Seven. Burt Lancaster with his rose tattoo and Burt Lancaster on Alcatraz. Kirk Douglas coughing in his room with Joe Van Fleet and Kirk Douglas looking at his dead horse in the rain. Lee Marvin in the Twilight Zone and Lee Marvin in Point Blank. Mr. Blonde dancing and Dennis Hopper with the gas mask. Steve McQueen laughing in the backseat of a Mercury and Steve McQueen smiling at the engine. Tim Roth as the only interesting monkey. <laughs> and Harry Dean walking and making Paris, Texas. Watching Paul Newman eating those eggs and Paul Newman telling George C. Scott that he wasn't getting any more money. Carl Malden telling Marlon he was going to hang. And Carl Malden talking to Blanche with that bent cigarette in his mouth on the waterfront. Jack Nicholson playing the piano. Jimmy Stewart loving Donna Reed, and Jimmy Stewart doing just about anything. Fonda in the Dust Bowl, and Fonda Jr. on the motorcycle. Lon Chaney with a thousand faces, and Lon Chaney Jr. running around with Frankenstein in Creature Features on TV. Leaves blowing across the floor of the empty summer home, while Monty Cliff goes to the chair 
Anthony Quinn yelling and dancing across the ring, dressed like a crazy Indian at the end of Requiem for a Heavyweight. We're all on the run, from the richest Maharaji to the lowest dirty stinking pedophile. The big, the small, the smart, the dumb, the right, the wrong, the lost, the found, the forgotten, the remembered, the free, and all the long timers one way are all on the run. Yesterday, I was the answer to 46 down in a crossword puzzle in the LA Times. <laughs> Wouldn't you like to be more than that? Sorry? Wouldn't you be like to be more than that? Would I like what to be more than that? Than this crossword. Uh, no, it's just, a, just something I noticed. A, a finality to the poem. It's a way to stop it. I understand, but I, I, do you have a goal? I mean, do you, would you like to <laughs> end up as Robert Mitchum, for, exam for example? Well, I, I'd like to have uh, longevity. I mean, not... That's all I ever really wanted was longevity. I'm not interested in uh, everything that comes along is unexpected and nice. You know, something like this is, is, is wonderful. It's not expected. I didn't ask for it. I didn't beg for it. I didn't plan for it. But here it is, and it's good, you know. I noticed that uh, when I look at your website, I can also order mustard and hot sauce. <laughs> are, you, are you broke or desperate or looking for a new career? I'll, I'll do just about anything to get out of the movie business. <laughs> Even if it's making hot sauce, barbecue sauce, yeah. I could become the next barbecue sauce king. I won't have to make pictures anymore because they all stink no, nowadays. No, but be honest. What, what I don't want to be in 3D, pal. Put it that way. <laughs> Let's go to the next chapter, the poet. All right. If you uh, well, it were my words, but what if, if, if acting was for sissies? Wouldn't, my words, huh? Wouldn't the uh, poetry you, you be You seem for to like that theme a lot. I'm not sure why you keep going back to it, but... I'm Mr. Blonde. Well, no, you're not. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's but me, wouldn't, pal. Wouldn't, wouldn't poetry be right for... Right now you're Mr. Yellow. <laughs> wouldn't, wouldn't poetry be for... Um, no, let's put it another way. Do you think poetry is a masculine thing? Um, I think that I have a lot more respect for it than I used to. I think I, I had a lot more respect for it when I started reading Charles Bukowski. And I realized, yeah, I realized that he was a, um, a brute, you know, a malcontented person. And, but he wrote about things that, that were dark and evil and disturbing and you know kind of it was almost like getting a driver's license to write so you know, I, uh, so is there is there uh, did you enter the poetry the same way you entered being an actor is that a, is there an uh, I did the acting thing because I wanted to find a way to make a living when I was writing because I was lonesome and I I needed an outlet for my emotions, and I would write stuff on a fucking napkin, or <laughs> I wrote one for St. Louis on a napkin. I write stuff on matchbooks and a paper bag. Even I, on I, your leg. Yeah, just, yeah. Yeah, you did your research, didn't you? Thank you. Now, I wrote a poem on my leg in the back seat of a taxi cab in New York City, because I didn't have a piece of paper. <laughs> I didn't want to forget it, so I... But when did this start? The writing? Yeah. Um, Were you at a low point when you started? I was at an um, investigative point with myself, trying to figure out what I was, my purpose in life was. I guess I was around 25, 26. And, but I was only doing it because I was trying to get some stuff out of my head. It wasn't like I planned on you know, being a, having a book or something. It just kind of worked out that way. What was the first thing you wanted to get out of your head? Probably the first thing I ever wrote, which um, I don't know if it's in there. I'm not sure. I wrote about a, a dog kennel. A dog kennel? Yeah. 
Yeah, I don't think it's in the book, though. So what's the story? I saw these dogs, these husky dogs, in a, in a dog kennel in the snow. And it was amazing to me that they were in the snow, but they weren't cold at all. And they seemed to kind of like it like that. And I just, I don't know, it struck me funny. And I, I wrote something about it. And it kind of, I think that was the first time I ever did that. It was a very juvenile attempt. It was a very adolescent attempt at writing. And it's in a box somewhere. I don't know. It's, let me find it after I'm croaked somewhere. Ask my wife. She probably, she'll have it. <laughs> Does it help to write? Does it really get out of your head? Um, you know, the thing is, is that if you think about something interesting and you write it down, then you might not really appreciate it at the moment. You might think, ah, you know, whatever that is. But then later on, if you go back and read it later, you're really glad that you that you did. I'm really glad that you put it down because I've read stuff that I wrote that I that I don't even remember writing. Mm. And uh, I was really glad that I put it down. And then it is kind of satisfying in, in that respect, yeah. Is People it, are leaving. Is it Goodbye. Also, uh, sorry. I'm sorry to bore you so much. Somebody's leaving. So I had a Rufus Wainwright for me. <laughs> Good luck. God bless. <laughs> You're fascinated. Yes, tell all your friends how fascinating it was as you rushed out the door in a stampede. <laughs> well, the Stetson is still there. Sorry? The Stetson is still there. Yep, there he is. He can't get out, though. He's trapped. He's, trapped. <laughs> <laughs> He's surrounded. Yeah. <laughs> it's okay. I got my own. Michael. Listen, as long as everybody's in the room here, before we go on, I just would, almost, I just would like to say something. Uh, All right. I lost a lot of dear friends. Um, Christopher Penn. David Carradine, and recently uh, Dennis Hopper. And uh, I miss those guys an awful lot. And uh, if you remember anything from tonight or remember anything about me sitting here, that's up to you. But please remember Chris and David and Dennis. Okay. Why is that so important for you? Because they were my friends. And Michael, mm. I want to add to you. Yeah. That's really nice of you. Thank you very much. Thank you, sweetheart. You said it, baby. <laughs> the high life. <laughs> hey, Cookie, listen. You know, go down this road one time. You better make it count, kiddo. It's all going to be gone in the twinkling of an eye. Just like that. We're all six feet under and done. Have fun while you're here. You'll fucking regret it for the rest of your life. <laughs> are, you, are you finished? Uh, or more? Yeah, yeah. That was great. No, I shout. Yeah, it was great. nice. Anybody else have anything to say? Please jump in. <laughs> I'd much rather hear from you than pontificate about myself. <laughs> Well, t take your chair. Not, not you again, but anybody else? Take your chair. Yeah, there's somebody back down there. What was that? Steve Buscemi? Well, he's become very anti-violent. Anti um, he didn't want an action figure of himself. And he refused to let his action figure have a gun. I don't know why, but he's become very... Um, he's a decent guy. He's a, he's a father. He's a decent fella. He's, he's almost like the Don Knotts of, of our generation. You know, he, he, 
He's very goofy, but he knows that he's goofy and he plays goofy and he's not afraid to be goofy, you know. It's a gift. There's, there's, <laughs> there's nobody quite like him, I, I must say. He's really, uh, he's very, he's, he's super cool. He got to play Mr. Pink, you know. That was a good part. I, I wanted to be Mr. Pink. I, I didn't want to torture anybody in a chair. I wanted to be Harvey's pal and get away with the diamonds at the end, you know. But uh, Quentin wasn't having it that way, so, you know. Can I ask you something again? Sure. What strikes me is that your father is uh, playing a big part in your poetry. Is that true? Um, well, as a torture victim, yeah. Uh, <laughs> my father was from a different generation. He was from a time and a place where you could discipline your children and you wouldn't go to jail for it. Um, you know, he was a firefighter and he was a very decent man and he was caught up in the world that he grew up in. You know, um, his brother was killed in the war and uh, he was a very handsome guy and he, he never quote, uh, I didn't see that much of him when I was growing up and because of that I, I was always kind of like, you know, had that... Mm, you know, that feeling a guy will get when he doesn't have a papa. And, um, I don't know, just made me write a lot of stuff because, you know, I, I guess more than ever, I, I really just needed him to tell me that he loved me and put his hand on my shoulder and say, hey, son, you know, you're, you're all right. But that didn't happen. It's, and it's, a, it's a strange thing with the father and son thing, you know. Usually when that relationship exists, you know, the... they end up getting together in the end, you know, when, when it's over. When, when it's all over and it gets sad, then suddenly, you know, they start saying, I love you to each other, and it's almost too late in a way. And it definitely is too late. But at least it happened. It's better than not happening. And I would just say that I know that my father thought that I was a... Which I was. I mean, I was a, a juvenile delinquent. I was a troublemaker. I was in and out of the jail, and... You know, he kind of figured out that I was just not going to make it, and he kind of decided that I was a criminal. And uh, so I guess I was always looking for approval in some way. I mean, there's a lot of guys, and I know you yourself, because I talked to you earlier, have a father issue, mother-father issue thing. And uh, I don't know what the hell it is, man, you know? I mean, I, I got six boys now. You know, the good Lord gave me six sons on this earth. And so, yeah, how ironic is that? Yeah, so I'm trying to be. <laughs> so are you doing any better? I, I, I hope so. I what? tried to do a lot better, and I, I, I think I have, of course. What, what do you consider? They're just surrounding me now, you know, they just want to take me off the top of the hill. And, why, know, why? I don't know, it's their job. <laughs> what do you, what get do you? Get dad, let's My, get him. Let's Michael. Jump on Papa and kick Michael? his ass. What do you think is, is harder, to be a father or to be a son? To be a father or to be what? A son. Wow. <laughs> no, you don't have a choice. I can't, I can't answer that. That's a question that can't be answered. You know what? You remember when James Cagney went to the electric chair in Angels with Dirty Faces? And the priest comes to Cagney at the end and he says, listen, I want you to be a chicken. I want you to turn yellow and say you're scared and go start crying like a little baby before they pull the switch. Before they burn you alive, I want you to say that you're scared and you can't take it anymore. So all these little kids won't make you a hero. And Cagney says, fuck you, man. I'm not going to do that. Nah, get off of me. He pushes the guard away. Get away from me, you fucking flat foot. You know, like, he spits in a guy's face and he's, ah, he's not going to do it. And they take him in and then you see a shadow on the wall of him. And they strap him into the chair and they switch back to the priest and he's like, oh, Jesus, you know, is he going to do it? Is he not, you know? And they cut to all the boys down in the, in the cellar and they're all listening to the radio broadcast and their big tough guy hero. And man, he starts crying. And he starts wailing away, just, oh my God, don't, please, oh God, he said, don't kill me. He's just so, so 
Oh my God! I mean, only he can do it like that. And you know, I can't touch that. But he just goes into this deepest wail of pain and horror, and just such unbelievable delivery of of anguish. And then, bam! You know that the switch goes off, and he's cut off. And you know, there's the eternal question: Did he do it for the boys? Or did he do it because he was really scared? It's not a question that can ever be answered. <laughs> hey, Sam. You got it. Sam Cutler, ladies and gentlemen. The one and only. <laughs> No, no, I, I, it's a good question, but I, I think that the movies are escapism, and they're certainly representative of real life in a lot of ways. It depends on the movie you're watching. A lot of movies are crap, and they're hokey, and they're bullshit, and they end up meaning nothing. But You know, there was a picture I saw recently called Gone Baby Gone, and the movie was okay, but you know what? They should have left the kid with Morgan Freeman at the end of the movie, and they fucked it up by doing that. By taking it away, they put Morgan Freeman in prison. You know, I think a lot of the movies from the 40s and the 50s, you know, were a lot more accurate in portraying an idea, you know. But I do think that it's a charade, and I think that some of it is... Um, I think there's something to be said for the storytelling aspect of it. And um, as far as the dying is concerned, nobody could die like Lee Marvin, okay? And the way that he went down when he did, I'm telling you, if somebody has to kick off, or if I do, I like to go like that. <laughs> well, be, be, be. <laughs> yeah, well, he's the only he's the only actor that's buried in Arlington Cemetery. So M maybe um, I could pop a question. Sure, um, because we still got five minutes or something, and I'd like to hear you read one more poem because I think that's just for my fun because it's such a beautiful poem. It's a poem uh, about sissies. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, man. You finished laughing or? Uh, no, I'm, uh, right. I'm here for you, pal. It, it's, it's called The Wait. And uh, for the audience, this is uh, the end of our uh, uh, little talk. So, Michael Metzen, would you please? All right. Wait a second. I'm by, by focals. That's real life. Yeah. Sam. Think of all the time people spend waiting for things, waiting for planes, waiting for women, for elevators, for food, for time, for shit, for red lights, for pain to stop, 
for happiness to start, for less, for more, for her, for him, for kids, for cars, for rooms, for fucking things that break and need to be fixed. Waiting for the last line to be read, for the tide, for the bribe, for money, for work, for plants to grow, for sunshine, for rain, for snow or blow, for calls, for balls, for sleep, for strength, for reason, for death, forever, forever and a day, for now. Thank you so very, very, very much from the, my, all of my heart. God bless you all. Thank you. <laughs>